Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us at our monthly webinar for Globe Mission Mosquito. I'm Cassie Sofing, and I'm joined by the rest of my team today. Please introduce yourself, folks. Hi, I'm okay. Dorian Janney. I work over at Goddard Space Flight Center, and I'm the NASA liaison for the uh, Globe Mission Mosquito team. And I'm Liz Burke. I'm also part of the team here, and I live and work out of my home in Kenai, Alaska. Cool. And my name's Rusty Lowe. I am the um, lead scientist for Globe Mission Mosquito, Boulder, Colorado today. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And for those folks who are attending, please, we use the webinar so that we can gather some metrics about where you're joining us from. And it takes away the coolest part about Zoom, and that's chatting and seeing everybody. So if you wouldn't mind utilizing the chat and letting us know where you're joining us from today, we would appreciate that because we're a small community, but we like to we like to know who's who's in our group. All righty, just our title slide. And this month we're talking about some of the resources that are available to you as you start guiding students in your IBSS projects. And the topics today definitely will lend themselves to each of those. I placed the webinar the Globe Mission Mosquito Overview Resource page URL here. And on that page, you'll find an awful lot of mosquito-related resources, things that you can do with your students, with informal, with lifelong learners. They're easily adaptable to any age group. Today, what we'd like to share with you is just an update on our global mosquito observation count. We have our featured speaker, Dr. Rusty Lowe, talking about her citizen science work while she was in Brazil. Dorian Janney will talk about NASA EOS and the, I guess it's not an upcoming mission, it's more of a current mission right now. And then Liz Burke and I will wrap it up with um, using mosquito data in the Mission Mosquito Larva Hunters Guide. Our observation total is just, it's moving at a pace that is exciting because we've got 37,533 observations. It doesn't happen by itself, so we really appreciate you taking the time to make an observation about mosquito habitats and mosquito larvae that you may find in your in your um, local area. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Rusty. Excellent. Thank you everyone for being here today. I'm real excited to talk to you about um, the citizen science work that we've been doing in Brazil uh, in conjunction with a uh, Globe Observer. Uh, I had the, um, the wonderful opportunity to uh, spend a few months in Brazil uh, working with the Brazilian Space Agency who is the Globe Brazil partner. And in conjunction with that, we did some workshops and we were uh, supporting some um, important communities um, in the Amazon as part of this work, as part of the mission of uh, the Brazilian Space Agency. And so today I'm just gonna give a little synopsis of this. It's not very mosquito centric because I was there during the dry season, but I will talk a, a little bit more about how all this connects at the very end of the talk. Okay, let's go to the next one, Cassie, please. So welcome to the Amazon. This is a, just a picture that I took outside my hotel window and there's nothing remarkable about it, except if you look at the detail, to me, it sort of looks like, okay, people, I'm gonna let you live here, but um, I'm gonna be actively reclaiming this area over and over again. And so it just, it just, just looked to me, it showed the power of, you know, of a biome, of vegetation and what people are up against when they uh, move into areas that are relatively pristine. Now, this town of Obidus, which is where I was working, it's been there for 16, uh, since, since the 17th century. So it's a very, very old city, but it's also very small. It's really a town, not a city. Um, it's about three hours from the nearest city by a fast boat down the Amazon. Okay, next one, please. So what we were doing uh, in this project is we wanted to um, see if we could support students in the development of their own research projects using Globe Observer. And as part of this, uh, we were in this the part of the Amazon you see here. So the light line is the um, 
is the uh, World Wildlife Fund, where, where they say the Amazon is. The, it's different from different from one community to another, but that's basically the Amazon basin. And uh, the light line you see kind of in the middle of the two, um, these two uh, green lines, this is the Amazon River right here flowing. And so you'll see right here, this red dot here is um, in fact the uh, Tapajos uh, National Forest, which is a, a forest preserve within the Amazon where um, the uh, biodiversity is protected. So next one, please. So one of the reasons we went here was to kind of look at, you know, what does uh, a pristine Amazon forest look like? And I'm sure you're well aware of some of these fun facts, but I just thought I would put these in here to get you started. You know, the Amazon is the largest rainforest. It's home to 3 million organisms and more than 4,500 tree species. Compare that to 600 tree species in North America, uh, no, 800 species in North America, 600 tree species in Europe. And so one in 10 known species on earth are expected to be found in the Amazon. Um, there are about uh, one and a half million indigenous people uh, distributed across the uh, Amazon rainforest, a wide diversity of ethnic groups. And this is a fun fact, um, if you're interested in earth system science, because the Amazon does create its own weather. And it does this, you know, through trans, uh, evapotranspiration, evapotranspiration of the trees. So the trees pull water from the soil and they release it to the atmosphere as water vapor. It rises, cools and condenses and returns to the forest as rain. So these are not like frontal systems that come in and bring rain into your region. This is continuously generating, right? So um, this is one of the reasons why just the, 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 the trees in the rainforest are incredibly important. And um, it's, the, it's the work that the Amazon forest does with respect to um, carbon sequestration that is storing carbon in the, in the trees and in the biodiversity that's found in the Amazon that really makes the Amazon just critically important for the climate system. Um, but at the same time, the uh, Amazon rainforest is threatened. Um, even though it has a lot of dense forest, about 20% of the Amazon as of this year has been cleared for timber, grazing, farming, and the rate of change is really rapid. About 200,000 uh, acres of forest are burned every day. And a not so fun fact is um, uh, September 2022, was, there was more burning in September 22 than any other month for the past 10 years. And part of that is, is political and the, the, the um, uh, has to do with the blind eye that the uh, Brazilian government was taking towards the Amazon. Um, a new government is coming in and we expect that to change. All right, next one, please. So uh, the Tapajos National Forest was established in 1972 because of this picture, essentially. The, uh, we are here in the, in the forest and this is a large clearance that was created illegally. Those tree, uh, trees that you see there on their side, they will are all harvested illegally. This was the, one of the trucks associated with that. This operation was closed down and the people there, uh, the scientists there were saying, oh my gosh, we can't let this happen again. And so then the process of developing this uh, tropical rainforest um, natural preserve was started. Next one. Oh, I just also wanna say there's a reason why this clearance has not um, been re you know, rejoined to the rest of the forest, and, but it is mowed. And the reason is there are indigenous, um, populations that live here and given a choice, they like to have an area that they could use for a soccer field and uh, for a meeting place. And so now, even though this was cleared illegally, but since it was already cleared and it takes hundreds of years for the trees to go back, they have left this as a, as a cultural, um, you know, as a cultural resource for the local communities. Okay, next one. So you might wonder um, about the local communities there. And we said that this is a protective forest. Well, one of the things that is happening is the, sci the scientists are working with the indigenous communities who have great amount of traditional ecological knowledge. 
uh, they know how to harvest um, sustainably. And you can see here on the right, these tree scars here that you see are from sustainable latex extract extraction from this uh, latex tree in Tapajos. And so I thought that was really interesting. You would walk along and you would see these trees that had been tapped you know, really for decades um, for the use of, of rubber that's being used for the production of products. And in fact, um, all the all the wood that is, is that is harvested in here is harvested in a sustainable way. It's used to create small items um, that can be used by the community and that can be sold in tourist trade, among other things. Here's just an example of how big some of these trees are. This is not by any means the biggest tree I saw, but it just fit nicely the the um, the team of scientists that I was working in. So I took a picture of them. Okay, let's take another picture. So one of the reasons why I wanted to be working in the Amazon this year is, you know, my background is actually in climate science. And um, when I used to teach climate science 20 years ago, I would talk about how important the, the Amazon is as a, um, as a carbon sink that allows, uh, that is helping to moderate or ameliorate the impacts of the CO2 going into the atmosphere. And exactly here in Tapajos, um, in this region, um, there is a research uh, facility which is called Site 67. And you can see, you know, you read about it in, in papers and it sounds like this, you know, it sounds like a research, you know, center at a university, but in fact, it's this little shack. The inside of the shack would surprise you because there's all kinds of computers and things in there. Um, but this is, this is the top of just uh, 67. And um, th these computers here are connected to flux towers that are measuring um, the exchange of gases from the um, top of the canopy of the forest to the atmosphere. And from this data, they um, recently published, this is just last year, an article um, that shows that in this part of the Amazon, which is the, the um, basically the southern east, southeast part of the Amazon, um, we are now, the, the forest is a net carbon source, not a sink. And what that means is more CO2 is being given off by the forest than is actually being taken in and sequestered. So the Amazon forest burning is so great that now it is not helping the climate, it's hindering the climate. And so this is a, a very, very serious um, situation for the US, for the for people all over the world. And so um, this is one of the reasons why I was really keen to uh, go here as part of the study. Next one. So, um, just about three hours away from the Tapajos National Forest, but within the same sort of area of uh, modified forest, we have a town called Obidus. And Obidus is a, um, um, a um, it's bigger than a village, but it's smaller than a city. And it's uh, located about three hours, I think I told you this already, three hours, by fast boat from the south from the city of Santarém, it's located at a bend in the Amazon where the Amazon River is flowing more swiftly than anywhere else, and this is probably why in the 1600s uh, the port the Portuguese put a um, a settlement here. So um, one of the uh, things in Brazil that's really incredible is they have a um, a network of federal institutes that are found in um, out of the way places and in low resource communities that provide students with opportunities for top notch education, uh, regardless of the ability of the community to support it. And so in Obidus, we have the Federal Institute of Para. Para is the state in which Obidus is in. And um, these students, um, are in a school that is well equipped with a, with a really nice computer lab. Um, the high school teachers have PhDs and they are trying to really support people that live in these, in these uh, low resource communities with opportunities to um, uh, get, get into career trajectories that will 
earn them good income so that they can support their families and support development of these areas. So it's really quite a, a remarkable uh, program by the Brazilian government. So we were working with a Professor Luis. Dr. Luis has a, is actually an environmental scientist. He does forestry. And this is um, his uh, class, uh, his e environmental science class. And we work with these students for over a week um, collecting data using Globe Observer. And um, uh, part of what we were doing is supporting the Brazilian Space Agency because they um, uh, conduct the IBSS, the Globe International Virtual Science Symposium uh, for, for Globe in Brazil. And so the anticipation is that the work that we have done here will enable this class to have a few really exemplary science projects that come out of this. All right, next one, please. So in this work that we were doing, I just wanted to give you a short picture here. This is what the old town of Santarém looks like. Um, and you can see that the buildings here are very old. So this is the city center. Okay, next one. Okay, so uh, when, when I'm talking about Globe Observer here, like I said, I was really hoping to connect with uh, mosquito research uh, when I came here, but I didn't realize that this part of the Amazon actually does have a significant dry season. And so mosquitoes were not a problem when I was there. Um, and so we decided to focus entirely on uh, using the Globe Observer uh, land cover tool and do the adopt a pixel project. And um, there are some uh, Globe uh, educators uh, like uh, Mike Jabot, who is unfortunately not at the call today, but there are some um, uh, educators that are using this, um, this uh, project as a way to engage students in research. We're right now, we're uh, piloting this with, um, with high school students that are working with the NASA STEM Enhancement in the Earth Sciences program. Uh, which is a, 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 a wonderful program for high school students where they can actually do research working with NASA mentors. But uh, basically what it does is it allows students to take citizen science data, which is usually opportunistic data like, oh, here's a mosquito. I'm going to take an observation. Oh, here's a tire. I'm going to take an observation. These data are critical for controlling disease. But for, from an analytical point of view, it limits what the students can do in terms of quantitative studies, in terms of statistical analysis, and so on and so forth. And so for this reason, we developed this systematic sampling strategy that enables students to really get into um, um, doing quantitative analysis, uh, developing code products, um, running code, and understanding patterns that they see. Um, and um, uploading and developing um, data visualizations that then can be used for analysis. So this red dot here is the town of Obidus. Here is a satellite view of Obidus. And we are looking basically at the left-hand side of the city. And this is the grid that we created. There are 37, um, 37 places where the students were asked to take Globe Observer Observations. Next one. And so this is, this is sort of like, um, if you are a scientist or you teach science, you know that very often that what you are able to do is not what you plan to do. It was that case with my master's. It was that case with my re PhD research. It was that case with research I've done since then. And it's the case here. So just to show you like the on the left is the ideal sampling grid that we had. And uh, we, went to, we went out several days in buses with the students and we collected these different observation points. And so, um, you know, we knew that some of them were in water. We wanted some in water so that we would have a representative um, uh, kind of uh, sample of uh, land cover images to use. Um, but there also was an integral forest here that is not um, heavily, um, it has not ever been heavily cut. And so we thought this would be very nice because it could provide us with an analog for what we saw in the Tapajos National Forest. And then we uh, then proceeded with the grid. Well, there were a couple of problems with this. And one of the problems was like up 
up here, there's a little gray square. And that turns out that that is a landfill. So that's a dangerous place to go. The students couldn't go there and make those points. Uh, we thought it would be no problem uh, to go into these areas here and uh, make these observations. But unfortunately, um, it's very dense forest. You need a machete and there's snakes. So we don't wanna really have the students go in and make those observations. And um, over here, you know, we were very interested because if we look at the satellite image, which I don't have here, but you know, we really couldn't figure out from the satellite image what was going on here. It didn't seem to be roads. It didn't seem to be forest. It, you know, we couldn't really figure out what it was. And so it turns out that this whole area is an area of illegal cutting. And so that it would have been very interesting to collect um, observations there but it's just too dangerous to go in there and take photographs because people there do not want the illegal work they're doing to be, to be documented, right? And so we had to make decisions for the safety of our participants um, you know, in, in doing this work, but we're still gonna be able to do uh, all the things that we anticipated without those data points. The two red data points there are the two more that are still, they, they plan to get those next week. So next one. So I, I, from my car, I just managed to get a picture of one of these, of, of some of this illegal, um, illegal burning that was taking place here. Um, but we did not want to actually go out and take measurements. Okay, next one. Okay, so they've collected this data. They now have a really wonderful uh, quantitative met, um, description of the land cover that they have identified. Um, we have, um, you know, they have 30, they have a total of 34 out of 37 data points uh, collected. And so now we're able to look at things quantitatively. And here are some of the project ideas that they are going to be doing for the IBSS, documenting land cover changes over time. And so if you see in the upper left corner, that's where their study site was in 1984. And the bottom right, you see what it looks like in 2021. So in 1984, it was pristine forest. And then just around 2009, um, there was significant inroads into that area. And we we're actually able to see this in spectral graphs that there is some kind of big change going on between 2004 and 2009. And you can see by 2021, this area has been an integrated part of the town with a grid system of roads. And, um, and so we, we are seeing all this, this happening now as well. Um, I should also point out in the Obidus, at the very tip of Obidus, um, there are some paved roads and there are actually, I think, three um, traffic lights, but the vast majority of the city is dirt roads and small, um, small holder, uh, houses with large gardens throughout. So we had our students go to this um, earth, it's, it's um, an earth engine app actually, that allows you to find a Landsat time series and you can actually download it, get the quantitative data and do uh, quantitative or statistical analyses using um, the, this. But you can also just look at things visually and begin to try and understand what's going on in your community. All right, let's take a look at the next one, please. And here, um, what we're going to be uh, seeing is some of the kinds of questions that the students came up with as they spent the time in the field. Uh, after they did the work in the field, we went to the computer lab. They actually classified the land cover um, in, the, um, in each of their quadrants. And here are some of the questions that they had is what, what is the degree of change in land cover in my city? Can we quantify that? When did these changes take place? And luckily we have the, the long-term, you know, Landsat's been around, it just celebrated its uh, 50th anniversary. And although the, the early data is kind of hard to get and, and difficult to understand and at a different scale, from 1984 on, we have some very good records and you can see a lot of that change happened since 1984. Another question is, what is the difference between the heights of trees between the forested areas and the trees in the city? And what's really interesting is that the, the city was sort of developed in different phases. 
and um, in the area that's most recently city, and that is the area uh, that uh, we saw in the previous slide, um, the trees are really small. And then, um, and then if you go into the older part of the city that was uh, built in the 1600s, you have very tall trees. And so, um, you know, I could see that this data, this land cover data could be um, the basis for a really interesting Globe Observer IVSS project that looks at tree data and land cover data. I'm sorry, in tree data and land cover data, right? And then um, a really important question for this is how does this translate to differences in biomass? How much carbon is sequestered in the different parts of the city um, since, um, since it was developed? And you know, the reason we query about the past is that of course and the and the present is because we want to uh, prepare communities for the future to sim stimulate conservation and to come up with sustainability plans. And these are things that these students are planning to do with these data. How can these data be used to stimulate conservation act, act, uh, action in Obidus? And how can we develop a sustainability plan for this region? And then the last question is very interesting because um, although uh, at that point in time, we are not collecting uh, mosquito data, there is good mosquito data being collected by this school during the wet season. And they actually have a series of, uh, they have a, um, a grid of traps that they have, they place throughout the city and they collect the, the data on a couple, um, every couple of weeks. And so that data can then be examined in conjunction with land cover data. And we might be able to make some very, very interesting and in fact, very important observations about land cover and mosquito ubiquity. So um, these are all of the things that are really, really important that they came up with. And the final um, suggestion that came from um, Peter Nelson, who is our land cover specialist for Globe Observer, is uh, he presented the new land cover map that was derived from Sentinel-2 data. It's called World Cover. It just came out in October in 2020, uh, 2022, and it's 2021 data. So because of the scale of the data and which is which our data is being collected. So uh, we have 100 meter squares, which is the globe land cover data. We are also analyzing it at um, 10 meter resolution by as we classify the vegetation. Our 10 meter resolution data maps exactly to uh, the 10 meter resolution of satellite of Sentinel-2 data. So we can validate this map the map is in fact a model product, it's not observational. So scientists need people on the ground to say, okay, our algorithm said that right here, uh, we're going to have a forest. And do you see a forest here? And we can say yes or no. And that in fact is the problem that we had in that area that I showed you earlier, which was kind of a triangle and it ended up being illegal cutting. Um, the algorithm did not do a very good job of telling us what was there because it's, it's such a, a mishmash of, of, of spectral signatures. So these are all really interesting projects that the students will be choosing between in their analysis for their IVSS project. Next one, please. So I just wanted to show you, this is the lab of the, of the mosquito scientist at that university. She, uh, um, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this doctor, she has, um, these are some of her traps that she's taken in um, during the dry season and the class will put them out again um, in the, uh, when the rains come. Next one. So um, just to conclude, I know that all of you here have probably seen this, this, uh, this uh, image before, but, uh, one of the things that is incredibly great that we can do as citizen scientists that nobody else can do, um, or nobody else has the budget to do, I think is a better thing, is whenever we make a mosquito habitat map or observation, if you can pair it with a land cover observation, it's super important because people who are using our, our NASA data from space, um, or you know, and or USGS NASA data like Landsat, for instance, um, they're 
you know, it's at 30 meter resolution, but what is 30 meter resolution to a mosquito? You know, we have to look at things in terms of the mosquito and how it makes decisions about its habitat. And this has not been modeled. And there are several papers that have been out that say, we really need people to look at land cover, tell us what the land cover is like, and tell us what mosquitoes are found there. And so um, really, this is the one thing, the, the Globe Observer Program is the only science program I know of that's actually actively trying to do that. So you can really help in this effort when you take a land cover measurement, see if there's any mosquito habitats nearby, or vice versa, if you make a mosquito habitat map or measure, um, observation, be sure to just take the three minutes it takes to take the photos up, down, north, south, east, and west. You do not have to actually classify it, the second step, but the photos are really, really important. Okay, next one, please. Okay, so um, I'm basically done with what I was talking about, but here are some of the kids in the field. And you know what we were really doing here is using this sort of place-based scientific approach where we started out with saying, you know, this is your town. What do you know about your town? What do you care about your town? How do people live? What are the changes that you have noticed over time? We started out with putting all that information on the board. And then um, we then had them ask questions about what they already know. And then we went into the field and we engaged them in, a, in this citizen science project and show them that, that the data that they are collecting are making real contributions to science, can make real contributions to um, sustainability um, and um, conservation management in and around their community. All right, thanks, next. Okay, so this is just to reiterate what we were doing. We're, we're starting with dry data. We're using open data, which is really, really important. We're getting them involved in using computer, uh, you know, computer coding, uh, developing spatial literacy, quantitative skill building. They are working as a team. Um, and, um, and also another part of this is communicating to the public. And so all of these things are things that I think um, really allow Globe Observer to make a huge contribution, not just to science understanding, but to build a whole broad set of skills um, that are basically science and engineering skills like computational literacy, like quantitative analysis, these kinds of things that this tool can be used for all of those, um, those other really important uh, skills that people need in the 21st century. Yeah, thank you, Cassie. So the last thing I wanted to make you guys aware of is that we do have a blog on Mission Mosquito. And uh, we have uh, uh, in this blog, students like, stu like students that you might have are welcome to um, upload a story to the blog. Uh, students that we have had over the summer um, working with us with the SEAS program, they have written blogs. And in these blogs, they talk about the, the uh, mosquito projects that they have developed and some of the problems they had and some of the conclusions they have. And I think it might be a very rich resource if you're trying to think about uh, mosquito projects or land cover projects you might want to do for the IVSS. And um, the the blogs from the summer are not yet up because Cassie and I've been so busy, but we're going to start trying putting up at least one a week. So keep coming back and seeing ideas and share these ideas with your students and also and tell them that when they do their project, we would love to have their blog um, up here too on this NASA website so that they can share it uh, with people in the community. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Rusty. That was really super interesting. All right, our next presentation is from Dorian. Well, thank you very much. I always feel an incredibly capable hands when I know that uh, Cassie's behind the scenes uh, working the magic. So thank you so much. Um, if you'll go to the next slide, please. What I wanted to tell you a little bit about today is um, uh, an update on um, the latest mission to, uh, to join the satellite fleets of missions that are helping us to better understand Earth's weather and climate. 
And this is a video that was just released that I thought was really good. It was just released on November 2nd to um, give us a kind of refresh our understanding um, about why climate change matters and to kind of get that, that global look. Uh, I, I love how Rusty was showing us this work that was done on the ground. And um, that's one of the real beauties with, with the GLOBE program is we've got the, the, the look from above with our satellites. And then we've got the people down on the ground collecting data to help us then really fill in those gap areas and, and better characterize and understand our home planet as well as be stewards for our home planet. So Cassie, if you'll push the play on this, and we'll take a look at uh, why climate change matters. Oh, go ahead. Well, it's happening. We look at the Earth from space and we measure it on the ground. And what we see is that the planet's climate is changing. The last years have been the warmest since modern record keeping began. It's serious. Even a little change in temperature can have big effects. And we're seeing some of those effects now. Sea levels are rising. We're seeing more extreme events like heat waves and heavy rainfall and wildfire. And we know that a lot of those effects are gonna increase with more warming. These changes are impacting decisions that some people make every day, like a farmer thinking about what crops to grow or a homeowner thinking about flood risk. But there's hope. There are scientists at NASA and around the world that are researching this. We know more about our planet than we have ever before. And we learn more every day. So we know why climate is changing. We know that it's due to increasing greenhouse gases from human activity. We also have tools that can help us better understand and better prepare for future climate change. So we develop computer models that help us understand how much it might change in the future. And we're also developing technologies here at NASA and around the world that can help us limit future warming or respond to the warming that we're experiencing. So why does climate change matter? It's real, it's serious and it's here. It's a, uh, kind of a nice video that you can share out um, and uh, you'll have access to these slides. You have the, the link there. We often have these, um, these neat video products that are created to help us share the message. And uh, sometimes, uh, we, we don't really know where, where these are housed or know how to find them. So this had just come through my email the other day and I thought it was uh, worth sharing today. Um, another thing I wanted to throw out as I watched this video that, that uh, hit home to me is um, one of the things that we do a lot of at NASA is we work really hard to make sure that this these data that we're collecting get into the hands of people who are working with decision makers. So uh, just today I was um, on a meeting with the World Bank where we're looking at the impact of the war in Ukraine on world food uh, security. So you know we, we go from having this, uh, this global view and we're able to work across a lot of different agencies. We, um, in this case, we were working uh, with agencies that are that are trying to be very, very nimble in their response, USAID and, and lots of different agencies within NASA with uh, USDA and other organizations just to, to uh, take these data and ensure that there are many, many ways that we can uh, do real world applications with that data. All right, so next slide. So let me tell you about the uh, the latest mission to uh, to launch early this morning, and um, it's called the JPSS two, or at least it was uh, as of today, um, it, and that stands for the Joint Polar Satellite System two, because it's the second uh, one to uh, the second JPSS to be launched, and. Um, once it is operational, which should be in the next couple of hours, then it's going to be called NOAA 21. So let me tell you a little bit about that. I thought this is kind of a neat way to, um, to understand how our federal agencies work together. We don't just you know, operate within silos, which is a really good thing. Cassie, if you'll click on the let's learn more. <clears throat> and when we're talking about NOAA and NASA, Generally, when we're looking at, um, at, at weather and, and climate, we uh, know that NOAA is our operational. 
And then if you'll scroll just uh, up a little bit, so or down a little bit, perhaps it is, so that we can see the movie at this at the top, so the other direction. Uh, cool. I'm gonna have to start it yet, but so NOAA is operational. Their data are used to help us know kind of what's happening right now and give us the weather reports that we see. Um, help us anticipate uh, the, the potential of where the hurricane is currently going to be uh, landing and and that sort of thing. NASA is primarily research. So we collect this data, we look at it over time, we develop climate models like they were talking about in that video, and then we make sure that these data are made available to decision makers. We also have a lot of researchers who are working closely with decision makers to kind of do some, some test runs, some, some pilot studies to ensure that, uh, that these data are applicable for these different situations. So this um, JPSS2 um, is, uh, is the, the latest that's going to be observing our Earth. It's going to be in a, in a polar orbit or a low Earth orbit. So it'll be about 500 miles above Earth's surface. And now, Cassie, if you'll go ahead and start the movie, we're going to watch a couple minutes of the movie. We're not going to watch the whole thing, but it does a better job than I can do of explaining why we're going to see this new satellite. This year, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, with the support of their partners at NASA, will launch the JPSS-2 satellite, the third in the Joint Polar Satellite System series. Flying as a secondary payload is NASA's low Earth orbit flight test of an inflatable decelerator, or LOFTED, a demonstration of an inflatable heat shield technology that could one day help land humans on Mars. Join us for a front row seat of the launch as we. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, we got two for the price of one with this launch uh, early this morning, and the lofted worked perfectly. It was just testing the deceleration into our atmosphere, carrying a payload, and it was picked up in the Pacific Ocean, and things went great with that. All right, carry on. Thank you. We take you inside the JPSS-2 satellite. With an ever-growing need for environmental data, the United States relies on NOAA's Joint Polar Satellite System, or JPSS. The JPSS system provides the latest advancement in observations gathered from a polar orbit. The images seen here were captured by the two satellites currently flying in this system, the NOAA-NASA SUMI-NPP and NOAA's NOAA-20 satellite. Launched in 2011, SUMI-NPP began as a research satellite and has served as the predecessor and blueprint to the JPSS series revolutionizing how long-range forecasts are made and long-duration climate fluctuations are tracked. Its sister satellite, JPSS-1, which was renamed NOAA-20 once in orbit, was the first of NOAA's newest generation of polar orbiting satellites that launched in 2017. Still in orbit, SUMI-NPP and NOAA-20 continue to work together. NOAA's polar orbiting satellites travel 512 miles above the Earth, moving at 17,000 miles per hour. Like its predecessors, JPSS-2 will circle the Earth from pole to pole, crossing the equator 14 times daily to capture a full picture of the Earth twice a day. The vital information it will collect about the land, oceans, and atmosphere below will help scientists so kind of giving you a taste of, uh, of what this mission is going to do. Um, if you want to see more, you can keep watching the movie later. Um, I did want to show you a way that I felt that the folks who were working with the outreach for this mission on the NOAA side, um, a really clever idea that they came up with as a way to share what this mission is going to do with the larger population, which is what I do for some of the Earth science missions, including the one that I directly support, GPM, at NASA. So if we'll go, if we'll close this up and go to the next slide, they came up with this really creative idea of making recipe cards. And uh, next slide. And well, these are, this is um, an example of some of the different educational resources they came up with, but we're just gonna take a quick peek at the cooking with JPSS. So if you'll just go to the next slide. 
And um, with this, what they did is they put, they had some people on their staff submit recipes. Um, so they selected this uh, cauliflower nachos because in selecting the recipes, it, it kind of gives people uh, a sense of, oh, I belong to that. I like to cook. I like to use uh, new recipes. And then on the flip side of the recipe card is information about how this satellite mission is going to be helping us to better um, know and, and keep track of where these different food products are, are being grown. And it also gives us a little information about one of the scientists who was working with the mission. So I just thought that was incredible clever. If you get a chance, go to the website and take a look at some of the different resources that they've come up with. And I hope that as you are uh, engaging your participants with the GLOBE program, you'll also be sharing with them the really fascinating science, technology, and especially the real world applications of our Earth observing satellites. So thank you so much for giving me a couple moments to, uh, to share that in. Thanks, Dorian. I can always count on you for the most current and uh, cool things going on with NASA. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Well, up next would be our presentation on using your own mosquito data. And to kind of set the stage for that, Liz and I recorded a presentation for NARM just to kind of give you an idea about what the Mission Mosquito Larva Hunter's Guide is all about. And that will be the beginning with Liz. And there is an activity in the Larva Hunter's Guide on using the mosquito data to tell a story. And it's a very introductory activity with some that we recorded as a video for you to look at. And you can use, and you could use it with younger students. It's kind of a follow along type guide. And then at, at the conclusion, then we have a couple more slides of information Hi, this is Liz, and both Cassie and I work on educational projects and for IGES. And we would like to introduce you to our newest product. This is the Mission Mosquito Larva Hunters Guide. And it's a resource that's designed to be used with the Globe Observer to enhance learning. And why, is, why did we develop this? Well, it's pretty simple because right now, somewhere in the world, a mosquito is biting a human. And most people are familiar with this phenomenon. Even you've undoubtedly observed it or probably even experienced it. But, but what do people of any age know about this phenomenon? So as with anything, it, it generates questions and we want students and citizen scientists to ask questions about that phenomenon. So what are the causes of that? What are the impacts of that bite? Why is it a worldwide phenomenon and what environmental factors influence it? Because we know that investigating, first of all, generating questions and then investigating those questions is what science is all about and it's and that's what leads to new understandings about what we're learning and what we have yet to learn and so that's kind of where we modeled our whole this whole project we want to start by investigating mosquitoes and the phenomena associated with them and the questions that they inspire but but where do you find the background information and the ideas to get started where do you direct your kids to start looking and start getting some information could all of this work to spark an ivss investigation yes of course it could so we are going to give you some more of that information it starts it's going to start with the mission mosquito larva hunters guide we chose the Mission Mosquito Larva Hunters as the title just to kind of set the tone because the hunters is a very popular theme and hunting throws in a bit of a challenge. And so it's intended to support both citizen scientists and students in their efforts to find mosquito larvae, to observe them, 
to identify them, to investigate them, and then to submit the data that they gather about them, ultimately, again, leading to an IVSS project. The power of this resource as a learning and teaching tool is its flexibility. It's in a Google slide format. So there's a variety of ways to use it from displaying it on a whiteboard and working off of that whiteboard with the kids to downloading it and having the kids work independently with it. So it can be done in a classroom. It can be done in an after school science club. It can be done in a homeschool setting, an informal venue. It has lots of potential. And ultimately, it's providing an engaging pathway to learning the biology and the behaviors of mosquitoes and building confidence in using the Globe Observer Mosquito Habitat Mapper tool. This guide follows a logical instructional and learning sequence. So if we look at the table of contents, first thing they're going to do is meet the mosquitoes, and that's where we start. It's an introduction to the organism. It provides 11 activities that include things for the kids to do and diagrams to examine and explanations um, and questions to answer about the structures and the function of those structures. And it, it even importantly, it reveals the characteristic behaviors that increase the mosquitoes odds of reproduction, which is the name of the game. And it talks about biting to get the blood. And we even introduce then the proboscis, the mouth parts that are so important to that whole process. Then we go into the next section, which is on finding mosquitoes. So they use their biology and they use those skills that they just learned to find larvae and to find adults. There are six activities here that lead to discovering the environmental factors and the human contributions to the places where they lay their eggs. So we use images created by a graphic artist and the kids examine those to get started on identifying places. And then they're going to go out into the background and observe in the field. You've got to get out into the field to observe mosquitoes and gather data. We include safety precautions in here as well, but we use these um, activities to have them get out in the natural environment and collect data. We include a video and instructions for including for creating a mosquito trap. So they have their their own trap where that they can set it out and monitor and examine that. And then go ahead and collect some data that address and address those phenomena, the causes, the impacts, the worldwide um, engagement of this and the environmental factors, and then use it. If you've reached this step where you're gathering and starting to examine your data, but you've reached this step at a time when mosquitoes are not present in your local environment, or you wish to include more data in your research, we have over 37,000 observations already in the database, and you can analyze and interpret that data, your own data, combine those to reach a conclusion. So in concluding here, the Mission Mosquito Larva Hunters Guide focuses on a phenomenon that we observe, we hear as it's buzzing around us, we feel it, when it bites us, and it routinely happens on a warm day in our local environment. Because in fact, right now, somewhere in the world, a mosquito is biting a human. The Larva Hunters Guide encourages students to investigate that phenomenon and supports them in investigating it. Let's take a look at where we can start looking at the data. In the appendices of the Larvae Mission Mosquito Hunter's Guide A6 Storytelling with Graphs, we're going to click that and it'll take us right to the right to the page. Do you still have your data from your work with the mosquito trap that you build? Because you did gather some data on the number of eggs, larvae, pupa, and adults in and around your trap, as well as the air temperature of your trap set over several days. Now, if you don't have your own data, that's not a problem because we'll take a look at some data that I collected in my trap during July. It's on page 89 in the Larva Hunter's Guide. 
As you can see, as I was observing my trap, I recorded temperatures in the low 90s for the first few days. There was no eggs observed, larva, pupa, or adults. And so in those columns, I place zero. And zero is an important number. Starting on July 5th, on my fifth day, I counted three larvae. In day six, I counted five. And for the next week, there were more and more larvae. And I was pretty excited to have this to count. I recorded the numbers of each that I saw in the appropriate column. So let's turn these numbers into a story for analysis. The data you collected will be displayed as a bar graph. A bar or a column graph is most frequently used to compare different groups of data. For this example, our graph will show the number of eggs, larva, pupa, and adults counted over two weeks from our trap. Let me emphasize, you can use any spreadsheet program. They should all provide similar tools to graph your data. And if you're a trainer or facilitator, if you follow these steps, your participants will have their own bar chart that's comparing two groups to use later. For this example, it's the data that I collect. My example data set was collected over two weeks and I checked it daily, so I have a date. I also have the number of eggs, larva, pupa, and adults that I counted, and the air temperature is also recorded in Fahrenheit. I've opened up an Excel spreadsheet you can use a Google Sheet, um, Numbers, or anything else. Um, they all work in a very similar fashion. And I need to create my columns of data. In my first column, I, I'll put date, second column, eggs, larva, pupa, in the fifth column, uh, the number of adults, and in the sixth column, the temperature. I've done that ahead of time for you to see. Next, I'm going to click and drag to highlight cells A1 to E15. This is the data that I want to put in column chart. So then I go to insert, chart, column. I now have a chart that looks like this. I'll make it just a touch bigger by grabbing a corner so you can see it. The graph story tells us the following, that something happened on certain days, that something had a value, and that it involved eggs, larva, pupa, and adults. Now, to make this graph story more informative, let's clarify a few things. How about the vertical and horizontal axis? They need some explanation. So when my chart is active, and I can see that it's active by the dots on the side, I can click on Chart Design. I can click on Chart, Axis Titles, and I'm going to choose Primary Horizontal. What information is showing on the horizontal? Each of those represents a, a day. So I can put, I'm going to insert Axis Titles, Horizontal, and those axis title is date of observation. What about the vertical axis? At this point, would the person across the room from you know what 0 to 20 means? Probably not. So let's, again, make sure the chart is active click on Add Chart Element, Axis Titles, and this is the primary vertical. And that would be the number of. Now, would a chart title be a good title for this particular chart? Let's make it something descriptive. I only had one mosquito trap out, so let's call it Mosquito Trap 1. Perfect. Nice job. I think we have a great mosquito trap story coming along and we've answered a few questions. 
For example, the graph shows that throughout the two weeks, I collected data daily. Finding mosquito eggs is pretty challenging to the naked eye because they can be as small as a grain of pepper. It was difficult and impossible to see anything until the fifth day when I saw mosquito larvae. In the water, I observed over two weeks and I saw and counted three larvae on the fifth day. Is there more to tell from the data? I'm sure there is. Questions such as, how long did it take for mosquito larvae to emerge between each stage? How long does it take for them to mature? By checking my trap daily, I can observe and measure the average length of the life cycle at that water or that temperature. Make sure that maybe you have more than one trap set up. Maybe put traps in different locations. In summary, recapping what both Liz and I have shared with you, the Mission Mosquito Larva Hunter's Notebook provides questions, background information, methods, field and classroom research opportunities, and data analysis. You can take all of these components and put them together to make your own IVSS submission. Well, thank you very much for, for sticking with us so far. We're almost done. These are the uh, URLs to download or to view your own copy of the facilitator's guide, which is the, as it says, a facilitator's guide, all the answers and everything that are on the larva hunter's guide. And we have it in a Google slide and a Google doc. It's under view. You do not need a Google account to get to them but it would ask you then to download and save your own copy. And again, this is a resource that you can customize and you can pick and choose whatever activities that you would like to share with your um, participants, whether they're in a formal or informal classroom setting. There's more information on the 2023 Globe IBSS, which is accepting submissions beginning in January of 2023 through March 10th. So there's a few months that you can um, get started on your projects. And we've devoted the last three webinars to providing you with information strategies and teaching resources that you can let your classroom investigate all kinds of land cover and mosquito habitats. There is a theme for this year's IBSS. It's Earth as a System. Um, there's all the information on this particular slide, and you can find that on the GLOBE website by just searching IVSS 2023. There will not be a Mission Mosquito December webinar that you use what we've done to inspire your students to work on a research project and submit it, and we'll see you in January of 2023. So thank you so much for joining us today. If there are any questions, our team is still online and happy to answer them for you. All right, with that, the webinar recording will be uploaded on the Globe Mission Mosquito webinar page. So again, we thank you very much for joining us and thank you to all the presenters. Thank you. Good to see everybody.